Hey everyone, whether it's the golden ratio observed in shells or the spiral formations of distant galaxies, the strange and complex designs in nature often leave us questioning what underlying principles govern their existence. Today we're counting down the 15 most mysterious patterns found in nature, starting with number 15, the fairy circles. From the inner workings of nature to the almost magical fairy circles, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are naturally occurring rings or arcs of mushrooms. They're mainly found in forested areas but also appear in grasslands or rangelands. Fairy rings are detectable by fungal spore pods in rings or arcs, as well as by a necrotic zone or a ring of dark green grass. Fungus is present in the ring or the arc underneath, and the rings may grow to over 10 meters in diameter, and they become stable over time as the fungus grows and seeks food underground. Fairy rings are the subject of much folklore and myth, particularly in Western Europe. They're often seen as hazardous or dangerous places and linked with witches or the devil in folklore. Conversely, they can sometimes be linked with good fortune. There are two theories regarding the process involving creating fairy rings. One states that the fairy ring is begun by a spore within the underground presence of the fungus, causing withering or varying color of growth of the grass above. The second theory shows that fairy rings could be established by a connection of neighboring oval gannets of these mushrooms. If they make an arc or a ring, they continuously grow about the center of this object. The best known is an edible scotch bonnet, commonly known as the fairy ring champion. One of the largest rings ever found is in northeastern France, and it's thought to be about 300 meters in diameter at over 700 years old. During the dry year, these zones are caused by mycelium, which coat the roots of grasses and other herbs in meadows. After some time, they're removed by biotic factors from the ground, and at this stage, the zone on the surface soil becomes visible. Long-term observations of fairy rings on the Shillingstone Hill in Dorset, England, further suggest that the cycle depends on the continuous presence of rabbits. Chalky soils on higher elevations in the counties of Wiltshire and Dorset in southern England are used to support many meadow-type fairy rings. Rabbits crop grass short in open areas and produce nitrogen-rich droppings. Mushrooms need more soil nitrogen than grass does, and a ring can start from only a few spores from which the mycelium develops. Subsequent generations of fungi grow only outward because the parent generations have depleted their local nitrogen levels. Meanwhile, the rabbits keep cropping the grass but don't eat the fungi, allowing them to grow through their competition to tower relatively above the grass. By the time a circle of mushrooms reaches about 6 meters in diameter, rabbit droppings have replenished the nitrogen levels near the center, and a secondary ring may start to grow inside the first. Number 14. Fur Waves a fir wave is a set of alternating bands of fir trees in sequential stages of development, observed in forests on exposed mountain slopes in several areas, including northeastern North America and Japan. Fir waves develop by wave regeneration following wind disturbance, and is one of the various types of patterned vegetation. When a tree falls, a gap in the canopy is formed. This exposes trees at the leeward edge of the gap to greater wind. These trees are thus more likely to die from damage and desiccation than windward trees. These leeward trees do eventually die, gradually expanding the gap downwind. At the same time, young trees start to grow, protected from the high winds by the surviving trees. The combination of dying trees at the leeward edge and regenerating trees at the windward edge results in the propagation of the fur waves in the direction of the predominant prevailing wind. One can view these from the Appalachian Trail as it ascends the hunt spur of the Mount Katahdin in Maine. Number 13. Patterned Ground Patterned ground is the distinct and often symmetrical natural pattern of geometric shapes formed by the deformation of ground material in periglacial regions. It's typically found in remote regions of the Arctic, Antarctic, and the outback in Australia, but it's also found anywhere that freezing and thawing of soil alternate. Patterned ground has also been observed in the hyper-arid Atacama Desert and on Mars. These geometric shapes and patterns associated with this ground are often mistaken as artistic human creations. The mechanism of formation had long puzzled scientists, but the introduction of computer-generated geological models in the past 20 years has allowed scientists to relate it to frost heaving, the expansion that occurs when wet, fine-grained, and porous soil freeze. 
Polygons, which can form either in permafrost areas or in areas that are affected by seasonal frost. Circles, which are partially melted and collapsed mounds found in permafrost. Steps, which can be developed from circles and polygons. And stripes, which are lines of stone, vegetation, and or soil that are typically formed from transitioning steps on slopes. It has been conjectured that periglacial stripes on Salisbury Plain in England that happen by chance to align with the solar sunrise at midsummer and sunset at midwinter gave rise to awe and veneration by prehistoric peoples that eventually culminated in the building of Stonehenge, which is a pattern we're all familiar with. Patterned grounds on Earth are characterized by the separation of surface soils into relatively fine and clastic domains with regular repeating patterns. These take the form of sordid stone circles, labyrinths, polygon nets, or piles, which can evolve into clastic stripes on sloping terrain. On Mars, however, surface patterns resembling those of sordid patterned ground on Earth have been identified at the equator, but more pervasively in the northern plains. The Martian landforms include clastic polygons, stripes, and boulder piles that tend to be at the larger end of the scale of the sordid grounds observed on Earth, with length scales of tens of meters, as opposed to usually just single meters as seen on Earth. The pattern follows the expected transition into stripes on sloping terrain on Mars as they do on Earth. Number 12. Tiger Bush Tiger bush is a patterned vegetation and ground consisting of alternating bands of trees, shrubs, or grass separated by bare ground or low herb cover that run roughly parallel to the contoured lines of equal elevation. These patterns occur on low slopes in arid and semi-arid regions such as Australia, West Africa, and North America. Due to the natural water harvesting capacity, many species in tiger bush usually only occur under a higher rainfall. The alternating pattern arises from the interplay of hydrological, ecological, and erosional phenomena. In the regions where tiger bush is present, though, plant growth is water-limited. A shortage of rainfall prevents vegetation from covering the entire landscape. Instead, trees and shrubs are able to establish by either tapping soil moisture reserves laterally or by sending roots deeper. Although these vegetation patterns may seem very stable through time, such patterning requires specific conditions. For instance, a decrease in rainfall is able to trigger patterning in formerly homogeneous vegetation within a few decades. More water will infiltrate at the upslope edge of the canopies than downslope. This favors the establishment of growth of plants at the slope up edge. The exact roles and importance of the different phenomena is still subject of research, especially the research in physics since the 1990s. Number 11. The belosov zabotinsky Reaction A belosov zabotinsky Reaction, or BZ Reaction, is one of a class of reactions that serve as a classic example of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, resulting in the establishment of nonlinear chemical oscillation. An essential aspect of this reaction is the so-called excitability. Under the influence of stimuli, these patterns develop. The discovery of the phenomenon is credited to Boris Belosov. In 1951, while trying to find the non-organic analog to the Krebs cycle, he noted that in a mix of potassium bromate, cerium sulfate, malonic acid, and citric acid in dilute sulfuric acid, the color of the solution oscillated between a yellow and a colorless solution. Belosov made two attempts to publish his findings, but was rejected on the grounds that he couldn't explain his results to the satisfaction of the editors of the journals to which he submitted them. In 1959, his work was finally published in a less respectable non-reviewed journal. A number of BZ cocktails are available in the chemical literature and on the web, and these reactions, if carried out in petri dishes, result in the formation first of colored spots. These spots then grow into a series of expanding concentric rings or perhaps expanding spirals similar to the patterns generated by a cyclic cellular automaton. The colors disappear if the dishes are shaken and then reappear. The waves continue until the reagents are consumed. In the BZ reaction, the size of the interacting elements is molecular and the time scale of the reaction is in minutes. In the case of the soil amoeba, the size of the elements is a typical single-cell organism and the times involved are on the order of days to years. Number 10. The Human Brain Yep, it's the human brain, particularly the gyrus and sulcus. In neuroanatomy, a gyrus is a ridge on the cerebral cortex. The gyri are part of a system of folds and ridges that create a larger surface area for the human brain and other mammalian brains. 
Because the brain is confined to this skull, brain size is limited. Ridges and depressions create folds, allowing for a larger cortical surface area and greater cognitive function to exist in the confines of a smaller cranium. The human brain undergoes gyrification during fetal and neonatal development. In embryonic development, all mammalian brains begin as smooth structures derived from the neural tube. As development continues, gyri and sulci begin to take shape on the fetal brain, with deepening indentations and ridges developing on the surface. The larger sulci are usually called fissures. Sulci, the grooves, and gyri, the folds or ridges, make up the folded surface of the cerebral cortex. A depression in the surface area allows for continued growth, and this in turn allows for functions of the brain to continue growing. But these are the only amazing patterns in the brain. The cerebrum, consisting of the cerebral hemisphere, forms the largest part of the brain and overlies the other brain structures. The outer region of the hemispheres, the cerebral cortex, is gray matter, consisting of cortical layers of neurons. Each hemisphere is divided into four main lobes, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. Three other lobes are included by some sources, which are a central lobe, limbic lobe, and an insular lobe. The central lobe comprises the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus, and it's included since it forms a distinct functional role. The brainstem, resembling a stalk, attaches to and leaves the cerebrum at the start of the middle brain area. The brainstem includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Behind the brainstem is the cerebellum. Number 9. Helmeted Guinea Fowl So the helmeted guinea fowl is the best known of the guinea fowl bird family and is the only member of the genus Numidia. It's native to Africa, mainly south of the Sahara, and has been widely introduced as a domesticated species into the West Indies, North America, Colombia, and Europe. But it's the amazing plumage on this creature that we're most interested in. The body plumage is gray-black speckled with white. Like other guinea fowl, this species has an unfeathered head, which in this one is decorated with a dull yellow or reddish bony knob, and bare skin with red, blue, or black hues. Males often show aggression towards each other and partake in aggressive fighting, which may leave other males bloodied and otherwise injured. They also attempt to make themselves look more fearsome by raising their wings upwards from their sides and bristling their feathers across the length of their body. Their nest is a well-hidden, generally unlined scrape, and a clutch is normally some 6 to 12 eggs, which the female incubates for about 26 to 28 days. Nests containing larger number of eggs are generally believed to be the result of more than one hen using the nest. Eggs are large, and an incubating bird could not realistically cover significantly more than a normal clutch. But if you knew your children were going to look like this, then you'd probably be extra protective of your eggs too. Number 8. Giant Pufferfish Another amazing and beautifully patterned creature, the giant pufferfish, also known as the Mbuna pufferfish, giant pufferfish, or giant freshwater puffer, is a carnivorous freshwater pufferfish originating from the middle and lower sections of the Congo River. This species is commonly referred to as a freshwater giant due to its massive size, growing to a length of over 67 centimeters. As such, these fish are pretty difficult to adequately house in a home aquarium since they require a very large tank and appropriately scaled water filtration. These puffers are distinct from other members of their genus due to the patterns of skin pigmentation in contrast to mottled or straight stripe patterns, such as those seen in Fahaka puffer fish. These patterns become more pronounced as adults, and like all of its relatives, the puffer is capable of inflating itself with water or air when stressed or otherwise frightened. It feeds on smaller fish, mollusks, crustaceans, snails, and worms. Species kept in captivity would require a varied diet consisting of shell foods to help ensure good health and prevent good tooth growth. And of course, if you do have a giant puffer fish in captivity, then you get plenty of opportunities to show off its stunningly patterned skin. Moving on to number 7, the Namib Desert. When it comes to mind-blowing patterns created by sand, the Namib Desert has few challengers. It occupies an area of around 80,000 square kilometers, and southern Namib compromises a vast dune sea with some of the tallest and most spectacular dunes in the world, ranging in color from pink to vivid orange. In the Sosuvlai area, several dunes exceed 300 meters in height, the complexity and regularity of dune patterns here in its dune sea have attracted the attention of geologists for decades, but it remains poorly understood. 
The source of the unconsolidated sand is dominantly from the Orange River, which drains into the Atlantic south of the Namib Sand Sea. For this reason, the Sand Sea has often been referred to as wind-displaced delta of the Orange River. Moving north, the sand gradually gives way to a rocky desert that extends to the Squakop River. This area is traversed by the Tropic of Capricorn and is mostly flat, although some scenic canyons and elevations are found in the same areas. For example, the Moon Valley system. While most of the soil is rocky, sand dunes are still occasionally found in this region. For example, sand dunes occupy much of the coastline. Several rivers and streams run through here. Although all of the rivers south of the Kunin River and north of the Orange River are ephemeral and rarely never reach the ocean. Owing to its antiquity, the Namib may be home to more endemic species than any other desert in the world. Most of the desert wildlife is arthropods and other small animals that live on little water, although larger animals inhabit the northern regions. Near the coast, the cold ocean water is rich in fish and supports populations of brown fur seals and shorebirds, which serve as prey for the skeleton coast's lions. Further inland, the Namib Nukluf National Park supports populations of mountain zebras and other large animals. Although the outer Namib is largely barren of vegetation, lichens and succulents are found in coastal areas, while grasses, shrubs, and ephemeral plants thrive near the escarpment. And on the plus side, several types of trees are also able to survive the extremely arid climate here. Number 6. The Veiled Chameleon If there's one creature which perfectly encapsulates the words mysterious and pattern, then it is the Veiled Chameleon, native to the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen and Saudi Arabia. They're born pastel green and without their distinctive casks on their head, growing this as well as becoming more colorful as they mature. Their variable color changes are due to a variety of factors, including shows of aggression, social status, reproduction, and stress. Females live for around five years and males live for around eight, and they breed a few times a year. For color-changing species such as the veiled chameleon, signaling is important between animals to prevent needless energy expenditure. Stable and non-aggressive states come with a static correlation and will have a dynamic change when the state is altered. Veiled chameleons will typically brighten their coloring before approaching a rival as a signal of aggression. They'll also maximize their stripe brightness for as long as possible to signal the strength of their bite. Rapidity of the color change is also telling of the success of a confrontational outcome. Before engaging, males will typically engage the color change laterally from a distance to maximize the opportunity to assess the coloration. When they finally engage with one another, they tend to begin the confrontation head-to-head, -head, which offers a clearer view of the vivid head color change. In other words, they might look pretty, but you should probably keep your distance. Number 5. Volvox Volvox is a polyphyletic genus of chlorophyte green algae. It's a species that forms spherical colonies of up to 50,000 cells, and for this reason they're sometimes called globe algae. They live in a variety of freshwater habitats and were first reported by Antoine van Liebenhoek in the 1700s. Adult somatic cells comprise of a single layer with flagella facing outwards. Now these cells swim in a coordinated fashion with a distinct anterior and posterior pole. The cells of colonies are interconnected by thin strands of cytoplasm. Now, when it comes to reproduction, they are folliculatively sexual and can reproduce both sexually and asexually. In the lab, asexual reproduction is the most commonly observed, although relative frequencies of sexual and asexual reproduction in the wild is unknown. Unicells don't always have flagella. They reabsorb them in preparation for cell division, so their life cycle consists of alteration between swimming phase, during which the cells grow, and an immatil reproductive phase, during which they replicate their DNA and divide. When the cells divide, they use what's called a multiple fission mode of division. They usually undergo sequential rounds of DNA replication and mitosis and produce 4, 8, or 16 unicellular asexual daughter cells. Researchers also know that on the basis of information from plant and algal fossils and molecular clock analysis that members of this family have been diverging from one another for about 200 million years. Combined with the fact that they are good experimental organisms that can be manipulated at both the genetic and molecular level, this means that it should be feasible to discover the genetic innovations that made multicellularity possible within these species. Number 4. Ice Eggs Ice eggs, or ice balls, are a rare phenomenon caused by a process in which small pieces of sea ice in open water are rolled over by wind and currents in freezing conditions and grow into spheroid pieces of ice. 
They may collect into heaps of balls or eggs on beaches where they pack together in striking patterns. The gentle churn of the water blown by a suitably stiff breeze makes concentric layers of ice form on a seed particle that then grows into the floating ball as it rolls through the freezing currents. In 2016, giant snowballs washed up on a beach in Siberia, some measuring a meter across. An ice specialist from the Finnish Meteorological Institute had been quoted as saying the ice balls are rare but not unprecedented and occur about once a year on the Finnish coastline. There are many things which could conceivably be referred to as ice eggs, although they tend to be referred to by other names. Yukimarimo, which are wind-blown balls of fine frost accumulated by electrostatic attraction in polar conditions. Snow rollers, which are naturally formed snowballs on mountainsides which accumulate as snow rolls down the slope and usually cylindrical in shape. And of course, a humble snowball, an artificial spherical object made from snow, usually created by scooping snow out with your hands and pressing it together to compact it into a ball. But you knew that, right? Number 3. The Fibonacci Sequence So, you thought all the natural patterns in this list were going to be visible, did you? Well, surprise. In mathematics, the Fibonacci Sequence is a sequence which each number is the sum of the two preceding ones. The Fibonacci numbers were first described in Indian mathematics as early as 200 BC in work by Pingala on enumerating possible patterns of Sanskrit poetry formed from syllables of two lengths. They're named after the Italian mathematician Leonardo of Pisa, also known as Fibonacci, who introduced the sequence to Western European mathematics in his 1202 book Liber Abaci. Fibonacci numbers appear unexpectedly often in mathematics, so much so there's an entire journal dedicated to their study, the Fibonacci Quarterly. Applications of these numbers include a computer algorithm such as the Fibonacci search technique and the Fibonacci heap data structure, and graphs called the Fibonacci cubes used for interconnecting parallel and distributed systems. They also appear in biological settings, such as in branching and trees, the arrangement of leaves on a stem, the fruit sprouts of a pineapple, the flowering of an artichoke, and the arrangement of a pine cone's bracts. Okay, well, so maybe the Fibonacci sequence is visible after all. Number 2. Snowflake all right, we've all seen a snowflake, but have you ever been lucky enough to examine one close up? And I mean really close. A snowflake is a single ice crystal that's achieved a sufficient size and may have amalgamated with others, which falls through the Earth's atmosphere as snow. Each flake nucleates around a tiny particle in a supersaturated air mass by attracting supercooled cloud water droplets, which freeze and accrete in a crystal form. Complex shapes emerge as the flake moves through differing temperature and humidity zones in the atmosphere, such that individual snowflakes differ in detail from one another, but they can be categorized in eight broad classifications and at least 80 individual variants. The main constituent shapes for ice crystals, from which combinations may occur, are needle, column, plate, and rhyme. Snow appears white in color despite being made of clear ice, and this is due to diffuse reflection of the whole spectrum of light in the small crystal facets. The shape of the snowflake is determined broadly by the temperature and humidity at which it was formed. Rarely, snowflakes can form in threefold symmetry, triangular snowflakes. Most snow particles are irregular in form, despite their common depiction as symmetrical. It's unlikely that any two snowflakes are alike due to the estimated 10 quintillion water molecules which make up a typical snowflake, which grow at different rates and in different patterns. Snowflakes that look identical but may vary at the molecular level have been grown under controlled conditions. Number 1. The Mandelbrot Set Alright, at number 1 on our list is something that is kind of man-made, but if you look at it for long enough, you'll start to doubt everything you ever knew about the natural world. The Mandelbrot Set is a two-dimensional thing with a relatively simple definition that exhibits great complexity, especially as it's magnified. This set was first defined and drawn by Robert W. Brooks and Peter Matelski in 1978 as part of a study. Afterwards, in 1980, Benoit Mandelbrot obtained high-quality visualizations of this set. Images exhibit an infinitely complicated boundary that reveals progressively ever finer recursive detail at increasing magnifications. Now, mathematically, the boundary of the Mandelbrot set is a fractal curve. The style of this recursive detail depends on the region of the set boundary being examined. The set has also become popular outside mathematics, both for its aesthetic appeal and as an example of a complex structure arising from the application of simple rules. 
Mandelbrot, however, first studied the parameter of space quadramatic polynomials in an article that appeared in 1980. A mathematical study of the Mandelbrot set really began work with the mathematicians Adrian Doty and John H. Hubbard, who estimated many of its fundamental properties and named the set in honor of Mandelbrot. The mathematicians Heinz Otto Peitgen and Peter Richter became well known for promoting the set with photographs, books, and internationally touring exhibit of the German Goethe Institute. The cover article of the August 1985 Scientific American introduced the algorithm for computing the Mandelbrot set, following which it became a prominent thing in the mid-1980s as a computer graphics demo. The work of Dowdy and Hubbard occurred during an increase in interest in complex dynamics and abstract mathematics, and the study of Mandelbrot set has been a centerpiece of this field ever since. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you to our channel members.